Well, hello, everybody. I am Cynthia Garrett, and welcome to Cynthia Garrett's Girl Club. You know where you are. This is the place where real girls have real talk about real issues while seeking to walk in real faith and figure out how to live out our real faith. This week and for the next three weeks for August, as a special blessing, what we're going to do here in studio is look at some clips of a very special series that launched me in ministry called The London Sessions with Cynthia Garrett. It's a show that has aired on TBN. It has not aired anywhere else or on any other platform. And if you like the excerpt that you're going to get sort of here, then you can go and watch the full one-hour episodes of these shows at CynthiaGarrett.org. If you just go to CynthiaGarrett.org, you can find out how to get there or just see the link in the description here. So for now, I hope this blesses you um, because I've been having real talk with real women for a long time. It's the thing that actually launched me in ministry. It's the cause of women that has actually made me care about what God's opinion is about our lives and about how we live our lives and about how we're thinking and about how bold we are or are not. I know for a fact that I was called to boldness. I know for a fact that I was called to wake up your boldness. So I hope you enjoy these conversations um, that are a part of the very first series in, in, in ministry, really, that I ever did. I call it ministry, but the funny thing is it's really, uh, these were just the first conversations that I had publicly with a camera running that mirror the conversations that I have every day in my real life with men and women anywhere that I go. Because everywhere I go, I'm just me. And I'm always looking for God's point of view in the madness. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Cynthia Garrett. And welcome to the London Sessions. I am really blessed and honored to have a gentleman on today's show who is quite unlike any other. He has been a part of a beautiful story that God has been writing through his life for many, many years, almost 80 actually, 80 at the time of our airing. And uh, I feel like this is a celebration of 80 years of his life, but more than anything, it's a celebration of many, many years of what he's contributed to all of our lives. And so when I feel as if I'm sitting in the presence of someone who is truly anointed, and truly gifted, whose heart has truly accepted the banner of humility, then I feel like that person deserves to be celebrated and there is no other bit of business on this show that's more important than us learning through this amazing person. So without wasting another moment, joining me on today's show is the amazing R.T. Kendall. He's a writer, a speaker, and a teacher who pastored Westminster Chapel for 25 years here in England. He's also written more than 50 books, and he has more stories than most men of God that I've ever sat down with. And, 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 and I don't know that I've ever sat down with anybody who comes close, actually. So um, let's chat. Here's the part that you're going to enjoy. One Monday morning, driving back to Nashville, the culmination of several days of some kind of anxiety. I don't think it was my mother's death. I just was anxious hmm. and, and, and fearful. And I began to, I think, I need to pray more. And I'd go to my room and get on my knees in my dormitory and room and just pray. Hmm. And prayed all weekend. And then on Monday morning, uh, heading back to Nashville, turned off the radio. I just started praying, and this heaviness came on me, really heaviness, and, and God seemed so far away. And I began to think, Lord, what's wrong? Where are you? Am I not saved? Am I not sanctified? The language that was part of my theology, theological vocabulary, saved and sanctified. Maybe I'm not sanctified. Maybe I'm not even saved. Two verses came to my mind. One was casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The other, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
those two verses. And I thought, I wonder why these verses are coming. I thought, Lord, help me to cast my care upon you. Then I can say my yoke is easy, my burden is light, but right now my yoke is so heavy. Please help me. All of a sudden, there was Jesus interceding for me at the right hand of God, praying with all his might in my behalf. I never felt so loved. I couldn't believe it. He's more interested in me than I am myself. He cares more about me than I do myself. And I quit praying. I became a spectator. Oh, wow. And I just drove and watched. More real to me, Cynthia, than you are right now. Oh, my God. Yeah. I could hear him praying. And I felt so loved. It was as if, it was as if, the best way I can put it, he saying to the Father, either let him in or I resign. Wow. It was like, and I thought, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm just driving. The next thing I remember, which would have been about an hour later, mm -hmm. it's now about a quarter till eight, coming through Smyrna, Tennessee, about 10 miles out of Nashville, I heard these words, Jesus saying to the Father, he wants it. The Father replied to Jesus, he can have it. And in that moment, I felt a warmth go into my chest like a liquid flame, zoop, zoop in and out. I felt so clean. I felt such peace. It wasn't just the absence of fear. It wasn't just the absence of anxiety. There was a presence, peace, joy. And then, for about 30 seconds, there was the face of Jesus looking at me, languid eyes. I saw his face so tenderly, and then it was gone. And here I'm at Trevecca. I get out of the car, go to my room, shave, and at 8 o'clock, I'm in a classroom, and I'm sitting there, what was that? Whatever was that? And that afternoon, one of my closest friends who roomed next door came running across the campus, came to see me in my room. He said, RT, what's happened to you? I said, I don't know. Something has happened. He said, oh, I can tell. He said he saw a glow over my head across the campus, and he said, what is it? I said, I, I, I only know one thing. He said, what's that? I'm saved. Hmm. Well, of course you're saved. What do you mean, saved? I said, Bill, his name was Bill Kearns, I'm eternally saved. What do you mean eternally saved? I cannot be lost. Mm. Oh, don't say that. I said, I will go to heaven when I die, no matter what happens between now and then. I've been to heaven. I'm going back. It was that real. He said, well, you'll change your mind on that one. I said, I better don't. Never have. I've known from that hour to this that I was eternally saved. It, there's a Greek word called pleroforia, full assurance of salvation. And uh, John Wesley talks about it. Uh, I knew I was saved, and it changed my theology. I became a Calvinist by sundown that day. I was brought up to believe you can lose your salvation, and I tell you right now, it's an awful thing to fear that if you do something wrong, you're going to go to hell. Uh, I was brought up very strictly. Uh, all that day, October 31st, 1955, all I could think of all day long is... I'm not going to go to hell. Wow. I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to go to heaven. And I knew I was saved. And by the end of the day, I began to see the sovereignty of God. I was chosen from the foundation of the world. And I became the assistant to the dean of religion at Trevecca. And he said, what's this that's happened to you? I said, well, it's changed the way I think. I said, I believe in once saved, always saved. I believe in predestination. 
Where do you get that, R.T.? I said, Romans 9. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. He said, R.T., you're going off into Calvinism. I said, what's that? He said, well, we don't believe that. I said, then we are wrong. <laughs> That's right. and, and he said, well, R.T., don't, don't leave the church. I said, he didn't say anything about leaving the church. I, I'm, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I said, well, you tell me what it means. He said, give me some time on that. He always respected me. He never crossed over to become a Calvinist like me, but he respected me, and I respected him. He's now in heaven. Uh, but those are the days when my theology changed. What about the grace doctrine? Because you mentioned, you know, once saved, always saved. And then I know there's all this talk, you know, well, the grace doctrine and... So what do you believe about that? Because I'm sure you have, God has given well, you some revelation on this. You see, he said you're going off into Calvinism. I never read a line of John Calvin. The nearest I ever came to read anything that could be called Calvinistic would be Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You had to read it in high school literature. And he's a Calvinist. Uh, but I, and then we all sang Amazing Grace, right. how sweet the sound, in my church. And I, I can never figure out how my old Nazarenes would say that Calvinism was born in the pit of hell, and we'd sing John Newton's Amazing Grace because he was a Calvinist. And then I began to realize the Pilgrim Fathers that came over on the, across the Atlantic, they were Calvinists. And I thought, could it be? that God just takes this Nazarene out of kind of the fringe edge of uh, historic Christian thinking and put me right in the center of the mainstream uh, because what I saw without reading anything except the Bible was what Baptists, Presbyterians, Luthers believed. And I, I saw it just really from reading the Bible, Holy Spirit. But here's an odd thing. I began to meet some real Calvinists, and they were fascinated by me, except they had one problem, that, that they believed that the gifts of the Spirit and anything supernatural ceased, ceased in the early church. They don't know when. Some say 70 A.D., some say 95 A.D. when John the last apostle died, some say 325 or 400 when Athanasius formed the canon. But that doesn't happen today. Well, then I have a question real quickly, teacher, teacher. If they don't believe that happened, then how did Jesus appear to you on that highway? Well, that was the problem. Yeah, They didn't know problem. how to cope with that. <laughs> that's what I said to them. They said, well, what you're describing, that doesn't happen today. Hmm. Well, I said, it happened to me. Well, that, no, that can't. I said, look, what I believe is what you believe. I was taught it directly. Now, if I'd been led to some strange teaching to deny the Trinity or the deity of Jesus, then you have a right to say that wasn't God. Right. I believe what you do without having read any of your books. Hallelujah. You explain that. They said, well, we won't talk about it. And it was an embarrassment to them. They were proud to have this ex-Nazarene believing what they did. But the, how I came to it, <laughs> contradicted their epistemology, way of knowing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I managed to get through it, and they didn't know what to make of it. Why do we always want to put God in a box? We don't like a God who is in control. <laughs> we don't like a God who can do anything he wants, whenever he wants. We far are more comfortable if uh, he doesn't do much today in the way of powerful things, and that way we're at ease. Mm -hmm. And we can live in our comfort zone. But you see, in order to have, this is my view. It's my son's view, too, and mine, and my husband's. So well, we're... <laughs> the, in order to have an anointing of the Holy Spirit, this is what I believe, you've got to be outside your comfort zone, and, and then after a while, what is outside your comfort zone becomes your comfort zone, and you've got to go out again. And so the idea of being changed from glory to glory is also being 
put outside your comfort zone to another realm outside your comfort zone. So until we get to heaven, we'll always be being challenged, uh, swallow our pride, forget your reputation, don't choose your friends on the basis of what they can do for you, but just go where the anointing is and he'll look after you. <laughs> yes, he will. Yes, he will. Thank you for watching. It's been an extraordinary time here on the London Sessions. I'm so blessed and grateful and we'll see you next time. Thank you.